Hello and welcome to World Inside with me, Tian Wei, coming to you live from Beijing on CGTN. Coming up on today's program, Russian President Vladimir Putin delivers his State of the Union address with the promises of bigger welfare spending and warning against the United States with nuclear missile. Is this indeed Mr. Putin's first stump speech to the March 18th election? And on today's feature in our special series, Women on Top, designer Tori Birch shares her thoughts on showing other female entrepreneurs the ropes in making it in the tough fashion industry. We begin our show in Moscow, where the Russian President Vladimir Putin delivered his annual State of the Union address Thursday. His speech comes just over two weeks ahead of the country's presidential election, set for March the 18th. Members of both houses of parliament, the cabinet, and other members of the Russian political elite are present at the gathering. Here are some of the highlights. Russian President Vladimir Putin delivered his State of the Nation speech a couple of months after December, the month he traditionally gave it. He said Russia is strengthening its military, transport and scientific infrastructure in the Arctic to safeguard its interests in the strategically important region. He also set a slew of ambitious economic goals, vowing to cut Russia's poverty rate by half over the next six years, improve health care and education, and build infrastructure. Backwardness is our main threat and enemy, and if we don't change the flow of the situation now, backsliding will inevitably grow. We have to create such strong creative powers and dynamics of development that no obstacles stop us from moving forward confidentially and independently. As for diplomatic relations over the last year, Moscow has described ties with China as being better than ever before, with improved trade and more visits by high-ranking officials. Mr. Putin's Middle East policy has made Russia a power broker in the region, with military progress in Syria, together with peace talks in Astana, and better bilateral ties with Egypt, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran. Expectations were high when the Russian leader and U.S. President Donald Trump met for the first time on the sidelines of the G20 summit in July. But it did little to improve relations with the U.S. Instead, less than a month later, Mr. Trump signed a bill approving new sanctions against Russia. At the Pyeongchang Olympics, Russians were forced to compete as neutrals at the Games after the IOC suspended Russia's Olympic Committee over a doping scandal at the Sochi Olympics in 2014. Despite the setbacks, Mr. Putin's approval rating has been above 80 percent for several years. He outlined other major policies in a likely fourth term at his annual address. Although he did not show up in the broadcast of the first debate of the presidential election this week, he is expected to be re-elected in the coming election. For more on Putin's annual State of the Nation address, we are joined in our Beijing studio, Cui Hongjian, the head of the European Studies Department with the China Institute of International Studies. Meanwhile, in Moscow, we have a professor, Tur Yuri Tabrovsky, who is a professor with the People's Friendship University in Russia. And in Washington, D.C., we have Joe Rubin, president of the Washington Strategy Group. Welcome to the three of you. I want to start with you, Professor Tabrovsky. During the State of the Nation address, uh, President Putin seemed to emphasize once and again about the unrivaled nuclear missile that Russia has developed. Tell us more about that. Is that going to help Russia to fight against the United States, at least rhetorically? Uh, you know, my first impression after hearing the annual address was that I'm scared uh, because almost half of the address was about uh, rockets, nuclear powered submarines and things like that. So um, it's very unusual actually for the uh, uh, State of the Union addresses to make 
uh, point of our military preparations. So it looks to me that the situation right now is very serious, that President Putin is actually addressing not the government in, or members of the parliament, he's addressing some brave guys in Washington, in Brussels, and telling them something like, gentlemen, don't you even think about it, because our military experts mm. are a little bit, uh, are expecting some sort of, uh, some sort of movements, uh, or maybe even using uh, tactical nuclear arms in Europe, on the European theater, war theater, uh, somewhere in Ukraine, for example. I see. So the situation, of, uh, the situation is serious, and apparently Putin knows more about it than we do. Mm. Mr. Rubin, I have to go but, to uh, you. But if he says something like this... Yes, I got your point, uh, Professor. Sorry? Let me go to Mr. Rubin in the United States. Yes, yes. For him to respond about that, uh, Russia is also accusing the United States of uh, building at least uh, up to 20 military bases in, in fact, in Syria, trying to, in a way, fight back uh, toward uh, Russia as the Americans believe Russia seems to have an upper hand over there. Meanwhile, Russia believes the United States is sending cruise missiles as well as some of the other possibilities of training the countries in Europe to use weapons against Russia. All these are acquisitions coming from Russia worrying about the U.S. possible attack against Russia. How grounded is it? Well, uh, the speech last night well, uh, uh, I think was... I let's think go to Mr. Rubin really in the United States. United States. Uh, I'm sorry? Th thank you, no, sorry. I, the speech last night was clearly intended to intimidate and uh, let the United States ah, okay. policymakers feel some pressure from Vladimir Putin. Uh, but that, that doesn't work here. In, in fact, it has the opposite effect, which is it unifies a, a perspective in Washington that Vladimir Putin is an aggressive actor, uh, that he has, in fact, uh, led a charge to undermine American democracy, that he has invaded Ukraine, uh, led a slaughter in Syria, and that, that now unifies opinion of frustration with Putin. And there are real, real issues here that we need to, to have uh, dealt with, and we need a, a real strong engagement with Russia on nuclear weapons, for instance. And, and I'll, be, uh, I'll be the first to say critically that uh, the Trump administration is proposing uh, mm. investments in nuclear weapons that are, are out outlandish, uh, unnecessary for our security, and clearly provocative as well. So we need to find a way to have a coherent American policy towards Russia. We currently don't. There's a disconnection between the All president right. and Washington in general. And, and that is creating a situation for Vladimir Putin to be much more assertive uh, in his rhetoric. Professor Tabrowski, we understand the president of Trump, when he came into the office, one of the very first things he asked to do is to have an analysis of uh, both the United States nuclear capability as well as that of Russia. So it seems that he has something in mind. In that regard, is the Russian president doing this list during his State of the Nation address, unlike before, as you said, sir, going to help Russia to deter any threat coming from Washington, or it might go in the other direction, only making Washington feeling, as they did already, a threat, quote-unquote, coming from Moscow. Uh, yes, I think it, he's trying to deter Americans from uh, some uh, very unwise decision of uh, uh, some uh, very, uh, very uh, provocative, very aggressive uh, steps uh, against Russia or, or maybe even uh, against uh, North Korea, which is uh, our neighbor. Uh, uh, you know, I want to repeat, uh, the situation seems very serious. If he spends half of those two hours of his annual address in speaking about rockets, tanks, uh, submarines, then the situation must be very serious. We don't know the facts, you know, we are just political scientists and journalists, but uh, for the first time, 
I heard all that, uh, uh, you know, list of uh, newest armaments, mm -hmm. which b part of them was even secret before today. Uh, so, uh, deterrence, yeah, don't do it. His address is, right. don't do it. Okay, let's go to Mr. Tsui here don't, in Beijing. Don't do what? <laughs> All right. We're going to go to you later, Mr. Rubin. Let's go to Mr. Tsui for now in Beijing. Mr. Tsui, is the situation as serious, quote unquote, as possibly President Putin has warned in his State of the Nation address from your perspective? Uh, yes, if we try to understand the real understanding, a real consideration from Mr. Putin, especially during the uh, address, we can find, we can uh, try to take a note of the, uh, uh, you know, environment occasion because uh, it's shortly before the uh, election, and also, of course, it's on the same line with the same tone, even with Mr. Putin mentioned recently about how is the goal of his uh, uh, country to make Russia. Greater again, mm. so we can uh, calculate uh, what the uh, advantages for Mr. Putin and his government. Was it a try to make Russia greater again? Economy, no. So I think that uh, yes, military nuclear power will be a very very in, uh, useful uh, instrument for Mr. Putin to get some more popularity, even before the uh, election, mm. and also to uh, get some uh, maybe a kind of a strategic balance with Western countries, including Russia, including the United States and the NATO, especially nuclear weapon. Because as we know, even now, it's one of the few fields, I mean, in military uh, capability right. between uh, Russia and the United States to try to get a kind of uh, balance. Mm. Will that work, Professor Tabrovsky, for President Putin now, uh, one of those candidates? running for president on March the 18th, even though yes. he seems to have quite a advantage over the other candidates for now, uh, is that going to come into his favor when he's talking about the strong national defense, when he's talking about how his administration is trying to protect the Russian people, when he's trying to paint a picture of threat coming from the West, just as the West was trying to paint a picture of threat coming from Russia? Uh, no, I don't think so. I don't think that uh, Russian people uh, could be more happy by hearing about all those rockets and uh, nuclear bombs. Uh, what Russian people uh, expect from him is more talk about economics, about uh, pensions, about uh, uh, education, about medical care. And this is the point of my my, my second impression is dissatisfaction with mm -hmm. his speech because uh, he didn't uh, propose any program. You know, he is, he is going to be our president for six more years. But I didn't hear about any um, long-term uh, aims uh, like uh, great rejuvenation of Russia. Mm -hmm. I didn't hear about uh, how he is going to achieve all those economic uh, uh, figures he mentioned. If the situation is like uh, like today, it's stagnation. We have maybe one percent of GNP uh, growth, or even less. So, what can be done to to start uh, developing? Uh, he didn't mention it. Maybe he's going to present his new program after he becomes uh, president for the fourth time in in uh, in March, when uh, the uh, government will resign. But. Uh, I would be much more uh, pleased, and uh, Russian people, Russian um, voters would be much more happy if he tells them today what's going to be with, mm. our, with our economy. That's right. Okay, let's go to Mr. Rubin. You've been an observer of Russia for quite some time. Mr. Rubin, will the threat the West talk about, so-called coming from Moscow, helping the West? to deal with the issue and the relations with Moscow eventually? Or, my question is, whether it's going to exactly the opposite, to create more tensions between Russia and the West, and not giving Russia the opportunity to look inside and resolve the problem on its own? 
Yeah, I know this is the, the perfect question. And uh, the challenge here is, is that uh, on multiple levels. First, uh, we should uh, remember that Russia is not a democracy right now. That, that Vladimir Putin essentially had the constitution of, of Russia rewritten so he could come back into power after his terms had expired. He has jailed his opposition leaders who right. have uh, significant popular support. So this is not a, a democratic election. Let's put that to the side. In terms of actual American-Russian relations and negotiations on hard security issues, there have been uh, blocks, primarily around the issue of Ukraine and now around the issue of Syria. Mm. And adding to that is the deep concern in the United States that as our national security advisor, President Trump's top aide on security said, there was incontrovertible evidence that Russia invaded American democracy in the 2016 elections. So uh, this idea that somehow the United States is going to do something to Russia uh, just uh, uh, aggressively militarily is a very uh, effective tactic for Vladimir Putin to uh, build support internally in Russia, but it's not based in reality. But it's the reverse. What's but, actually but, but happening Rubin, is that, that we're on the receiving end of Russian attacks. Mm. But Mr. Rubin, by, with Washington trying to paint a picture of Russia infiltrating in yes. all kinds of channels toward the 2016 presidential election, Hasn't that also created a kind of negative uh, impact uh, in Russia about uh, the United States uh, as well? That's the question, isn't it? Yeah, it, it is. And, and, and I think for the, the ordinary Russian, they probably look at what's happening here in Washington and, and, and laugh a bit or chuckle a bit, trying to understand why are the Americans thinking about this. And, and also, dis they must be disappointed that the relations are going in the wrong direction, as are we. Uh, I historically was a very uh, active uh, supporter of nuclear agreements between the U.S. and Russia, of Russian participation in the Iran nuclear deal, which has been strong. There are ways for us to work together, and we have to find them. But uh, nonetheless, uh, it is a simmering concern. And there's a, a, a paradox here that the, the Republicans, who historically have been the most hardline mm -hmm. on Russia, uh, now benefited potentially from uh, this invasion and at a minimum are not, through President Trump, putting pressure on Russia. And the Democrats, who historically, under President Obama in right. particular, wanted to engage Russia, are now in a very hostile uh, position. So uh, We need to fix this. We need a coherent policy. So, Professor Kavrovsky, it seems that neither of the party has ever graduated yes. from the Cold War mentality. Uh, you know, Mr. Rubin told that Russia is trying to subvert American uh, democracy. Actually, American uh, democracy is now lying in shambles. And it's not Russians who subverted it, it's Americans who uh, American society now is divided, is in crisis. And no Russian uh, efforts could achieve it. Uh, it's uh, uh, mm. the American crisis. And America tries mm. to, uh, to solve this problem, to unite the nation by aggressive uh, words and deeds towards uh, China, towards Russia, but it, it won't work. Okay. And uh, we don't want American democracy. We want Russian democracy with Russian characteristics, just like the Chinese want Chinese democracy with Chinese characteristics. Give okay. us time to a solve our problems. And the American people problems. want confidence that we elect our leaders. All right. We, we, have, we could have a huge, a huge hour of debate about this, uh, political systems. But for now, I want to go to you, Mr. Tway. My question really is, let's just put the political system aside, mm -hmm. the, local, uh, the domestic election aside. Talk about whether any of our governments have ever graduated from the Cold War mentality. In here, we are talking about Russia and the United States because it, apparently these are the two players toward one another. Uh, you mean between uh, China and Russia? No, I mean Russia and the United States. Okay. Yes, I think that uh, uh, so far, of course, I think uh, it, it looks like there is a very, very, I mean, uh, interesting, I mean, uh, you know, uh, a, a partner, I mean, I, I would like to say, between uh, Mr. Putin and uh, Mr. Trump. And we can find out uh, uh, so huge impact from uh, domestic politics, especially from the United States, mm. on over these uh, bilateral relations between two countries. And at the same time, we think that, uh, yes, there is a kind of a structural contradiction between those two countries, not only because of the history, because of, uh, you know, 
uh, uh, mistrust between two countries and also a kind of uh, you know different direction of policy mm. and even a kind of uh, maybe a difference of assistance so I think that uh, yes uh, uh, no matter how is this uh, uncertainties raised by Mr. Uh, you know, Trump okay. and uh, you know the gaming between the Congress and the administration and also I think that uh, the framework of this uh, battle is as mm -hmm. bad as possible. Well, this is exactly what we're talking about, isn't it, uh, Mr. Rubin? I mean, these two men, uh, Mr. Trump and Mr. Putin, probably they are dancing a tango because they all try to create some kinds of concepts as a result of the existence of the other. Uh, but the question is, is that really the truth or that is only coming from the analysts? Mr. Rubin. Well, they're, they're caught in this, this uh, bizarre embrace, in a way, where uh, President Trump has consistently argued that we need to have better relations with Russia, which is correct. We do need better relations with Russia, but we also need to be honest about some of the issues that are on the table, such as U Ukraine, Syria, and the Russian involvement in our democracy. Uh, and, and because of that failure to talk right. about those full issues, it's made it difficult for President Trump to mobilize American political support for more engagement. And uh, I, I've witnessed this over the years. It goes up and down. And you're right, structurally, there is still a deep Cold War mistrust underneath in the system uh, between the two, the two powers. And, and we still need, we still need to, to find ways to talk at the summit level in a way that brings all of the politicians from both sides together. We haven't had that in some time, and it may be time okay. for a real legitimate overall comprehensive discussion. Professor Tabrovsky, what does it take for all of us yes. to avoid that, that another round of arms race, for example, about nuclear arms race? We see the United States and Russia have both boasted about their nuclear arms capabilities now with the latest update. Can we avoid a new round of that in our region? Uh, well, actually, there is a third player, the third player in this nuclear game, uh, namely China, mm -hmm. which is also very actively developing its nuclear arsenals. Uh, and uh, it, it can be explained, because for America, there are two existential enemies. It's China and Russia. Uh, American, the pre at present, uh, America cannot live uh, under the same heaven with uh, either Russia or China because they are too big, they are too independent, All right. they are too rich uh, in minerals, in, uh, you know, in uh, human resources, and uh, both Beijing and Moscow doesn't want to bow to America. Okay. Uh, so uh, uh, America uh, first dismembered the uh, Warsaw Pact, then it uh, uh, dismembered uh, Soviet Union, and then it crossed some red lines, which it shouldn't cross. Okay. And we won't tolerate any more incursions uh, uh, across the red lines. We this heard, is my position. Yeah, we heard that our Russian friend usually wants to take China with it every time when we discuss uh, about the relations between Russia and the United States. But Mr. Cui, help us to understand, are we going to get into another round of nuclear arms race? Yes, I think certainly there will be some uh, risk for this uh, uh, trend. I mean, uh, militarily there will be a uh, you know, risk for another round of uh, uh, military race. And also strategically there will be uh, some uh, danger, dangers for a uh, new Cold War, just like uh, especially since the uh, Ukrainian crisis. But of course, I think that uh, now, at the same time, some more positive factors and also uh, get a racing and a racing rising and rising because as we know okay. uh, so far China uh, become more uh, responsible for any kind of uh, you know regional and international community affairs and also China try to you know get some more uh, uh, collaboration with any partners including Russia and including even uh, United States on some uh, uh, special fields so I think uh, yes there will be some uh, very, very I mean, important okay. uh, uh, ex uh, uh, relations on this kind of uh, trilateral relation I mean, between China, Russia, and the United States. But of course, I think that uh, to, to a large degree, a kind of a, a collaboration between China and Russia will give us uh, so many I mean, importance to this kind of strategic balance uh, in the world. All but right. of course, China will not 
uh, you know, deny any kind of uh, you know efforts to get more cooperation with the United States at the same time. Che Hong Jian, Yuri Tabrovsky, Joe Rubin, gentlemen, thank you so much for the three of you for being with us. Really appreciate it. You are watching World Inside with me, Tian Wei. Still to come on our program. On today's edition of our series, Women on Top, I speak with Tori Verge, who tells us how female entrepreneurs like her are empowering other women to strike it out on their own. Welcome back. This week, we'll bring a special series to you that is a series of interviews, Women on Top. Today, feature is the founder and CEO of a successful American fashion label, Tori Birch. Many successful female entrepreneurs and business leaders have carved out their own mark in the fashion industry. And as their careers rise, they are using their voices to inspire and to help other women to do better and do their best. Tori Birch is one of them. Since the establishment of the Tory Birch Foundation, many women have started their own businesses with access to low-cost capital, education, and mentorship from the foundation. Women should support women, something Tory Birch stressed in her interview. We've seen some political trends of deglobalization these days. What does that mean? for the fashion industry? I look at the fashion industry as I look at our company that from the beginning we've wanted a global lifestyle brand. We, we think about the world as a smaller place and I think particularly with the internet and everyone has so much access and, and so much information that it's important to think that way. Um, different markets are more relevant for us um, than others. That said, we want to build the brand globally in, in a way that um, it feels good and, and our China business resembles what we're doing in the United States. When it gets too segmented, that's when I think it's a problem. This whole concept of omni-channel is important and particularly with e-commerce. I mean, e-commerce will be interesting to see mm -hmm. for a brand like ours or a luxury brand how it unfolds. I think it will, but it will take some time. Are you afraid that people will say, Tori Birch? She's political. <laughs> no, <laughs> I'm not. I hope they would say... Why not? Everybody's afraid. It seems, for example, those in the Hollywood, they're afraid people are putting a brand on their forehead saying she or she is political. I, I think um, it's all in the way you message things. And um, I think if you don't stand up for things in life, what's the point? If you don't stand up for women's issues, when you really deeply believe in it, then I wouldn't feel good about myself. I, I have a voice. I, I want to inspire others to have a voice too. I'm not telling them what to say. You have always been very active, even politically. But the question is, as a business person these days who are doing global business around the world, you travel around, you hear people's voices. Do politics these days still help? I, if I said no, I would be a pessimist. So for me, I have to be optimistic and not... Why do you have to be optimistic? Because I am optimistic. <laughs> and, and, and certainly, I think, I think we need to fix it. And I think there's a long way to go. But I'm not, I'm not saying it can't be done. I mm -hmm. think it can be done. Very interesting. Talking about the content, what are the issues that make you the most passionate? Um, well, human rights. <laughs> I think... Um, there's a race problem in the United States and elsewhere and an acceptance of all people regardless of gender, religion, race. Um, I deeply believe in equal rights for all people so there are certain things that um, I think um, are part of humanity and it's a human right. <laughs> it's not, it's, it should be a given. As a business leader and as someone who is passionate about politics what do you think, Tori, if I could ask you from a personal perspective, what kind of America you want? And what kind of role your country, the United States, should and could play? Well, I think America is great. And I will say any state or country can be better. And certainly there's parts of our history that are not great. I like to learn from our mistakes. If I could wish for anything, I wish people would acknowledge mistakes, learn from them, and strive to do better. Do you have these kind of conversations with your fashion circle friends? 
Um, I would say yes and no. I have a very diverse group of friends. Mm -hmm. And it's not like I'm um, as political as you're saying. I care about issues. And I think that um, in order for anyone to create change, mm -hmm. you have to have a belief and then you have to do something about it. Tori, let's talk about women and business. You started as an entrepreneur yourself, a small boutique, and now maybe even a few billions. Um, what do you make of your growth? How much would that be inspiration for other women? Are we, of course, you know, living in a very different time? So will entrepreneurship still work? Yes, I think entrepreneurship, well, America is the perfect example of entrepreneurship. And I think one of the things I'm passionate about is going around the world and working with, with communities to understand that as well. I don't do it enough yet, but in the future, I would love to do more of that. Entrepreneurship is um, the, one of the cornerstones of, of what we should all be proud of. If you think about great businesses, they were all started somewhere. And so it exists everywhere and I think that it's a different time people can look at me as an impossible um, thing that happened I never imagined I could do what I'm doing and it should give people hope when you ask me or if someone were to ask me 14 years ago what I would be doing today mm -hmm. I could tell you I would have had no idea and you have been very active in encouraging female entrepreneurs. I understand back in the year 2014, during Obama administration's uh, newly coming into the office for the second term, you were being inaugurated with, as the member of the presidential ambassador for entrepreneurs. Um, what kinds of difficulties do you think the newer generation of entrepreneurs are facing these days compared to your time? Well, I think any time is hard. Business is hard. A startup is hard. But I think if you find your passion, um, that's, that's the first step. Um, access to capital is difficult. For women, it's a proven fact. Women have a harder time getting access to capital. There's a lot that can be done to improve that, and mm -hmm. certainly our foundation, um, that is our goal, is to be the go-to source for mm -hmm. women to get access to low-cost capital, to get mentoring and education, and then also to learn about different issues in business on our, on our website. Mm. Um, it's ToriBirchFoundation.org, and mm. I think there's a lot of information that can help people. If we could set up a community that teaches women how to mentor each other, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship, it's, it would be a wonderful thing. Some of the entrepreneurs who told me, uh, particularly philanthropists, that they saw that the very beginning was about giving out money, you know, giving the wealth away and to support people in their, for their better cause. But later they found this, there's a tremendous amount of work yeah. to make sure the money will be given to the right people for the right projects at the right time for the right cause. Yes. So what does that mean to you? Um, it sounds very familiar. <laughs> I think our partnership with Bank of America, one of the challenges was that they said we could give $20 million out in the first two years, and we thought, wow, that's easy. And, and really what we learned is that we did have to find the right women in the right cycle of their business um, at the right time. How did you find? Uh, a How lot of work. Your well, working. Give me some examples. Well, we, we work with community, local community lenders, CDFIs. Mm -hmm. And, and it's a lot of vetting, a lot of work that my team did and Bank of America's team, and really finding um, businesses that have validity, um, businesses that could scale, businesses that had um, a trajectory that could really use the loan. Women pay back their loans. That's oh, a great do. thing. They do. Um, so I think it was vetting. We're now, we gave out, we have given out over $22 million in the last two years, and we're averaging over a million dollars a month. So, Are there some fresh examples you're best uh, impressed with? Well, we just had um, our fellowship program. The winner is a woman that started a chocolate factory because her mom was sick and her mom had taught her to, to make chocolate bars and she was out of Maine. It turns out that she had a great company and great idea. The whole state of Maine got, got behind her. <laughs> uh, Bixby Bars is his name. Then there's a woman um, who um, actually um, consults on getting diversity into, into companies. There's so many different kinds of companies 
The one thing that is um, very similar, they're all inspiring. Mm -hmm. These women are talented, they're smart, and they are often holding down two jobs, single mothers, and they're getting it done. Do women really support women? I do. I have um, a, a deep feeling that women do support women. I remember there was a saying by the yeah. former secretary. <laughs> by Milan Verveer or was it Hillary Clinton? Um, I, I think Hillary it was Clinton. in her administration. Yeah. She said um, there's a special place in hell in yeah. which uh, women, women are don't those support those women. Yeah. <laughs> It's a great thing. I hope that part of the hell is not very big. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I, I'm, sure, I'm, I'm sure, hopefully, we, we won't find out about that. <laughs> <laughs> we wouldn't with what you have been doing. You started with a small boutique. Your business grows, as we mentioned earlier. You also did a restructuring, large scale, recently. And that made your company grow even faster. And you have a sports line now. Congratulations. These are all successful decisions. But do you sometimes feeling a little bit nervous about your earlier decision? And also being a little bit nervous when all the others have become public company. They have got big cash. And can you really, for the future, com compete with them if you are still private? So it doesn't drive me to think about competing with big businesses. It drives me to create a really profitable, wonderful business that we're proud of. Um, do, do things keep me up at night all the time? <laughs> I mean, I would say yes. Um, but I, I, I think I'm pretty decisive. Um, I try not to look back. Have I made mistakes? Of course. I've made many. I think that the important thing is to learn from them and really try not to repeat them. What is the biggest one you have? Um, when I keep people in the wrong positions and I realize that a loyalty is, is actually disloyal to the whole company. <laughs> you know, when, mm. I'm, when I'm trying to do the right thing for someone, it affects everyone around them and it could actually be very harmful. So um, it's hard. It's hard to, to make changes with people and, and restructure a company. It's a very difficult decision, but it was essential. Mm. And it was actually... I was thinking about it before I saw the macro environment changing and I knew that I had a Herculean ev uh, event ahead mm -hmm. and so that's daunting but I knew that it had to be done. I'm not a fashion insider but when I as an outsider look at the latest the fashion trends it seems to me brands are nervous the biggest brands I mean they want to be viewed as so-called updated they want to be viewed as trendy quote-unquote and sometimes to me it seems they have lost some of their previous personalities mm -hmm. any advice to us and to yourself and to myself yes <laughs> Um, I think to jump on that nervous wagon is a mistake. Mm -hmm. uh, that said, you will be nervous, but to just um, try to generate things, change, your change, change it. it, try to be something you're not because something's working in the market, looking at last year's sales and trying to replicate that for next year, it, it doesn't work, and we've been there and we've done it ourselves. So I've, I've learned from experience. Um, we don't want to be just big for big sake. Mm -hmm. We want to have the right growth. Um, we want to be relevant, of course, but we're not just thinking about trend. Mm -hmm. I like the idea of women wearing our pieces for years. So for me, it's about product and our customer and just designing the best possible product and really believing in it. Mm -hmm. um, I talk to our team about buying less and believing in it more. Hmm. Very interesting, a slogan over there. Thank you so much, Thank Corey, you. for being with us. Thank All the best. You. Thank you. Thank you. All really appreciate it. Well, tune in again tomorrow for our final feature of our special series, Women on Top. I picked the brains of a famous master storyteller writer, Yang Geling. That interview tomorrow. And uh, that is all the time we have for today. If you'd like to see more, try to find us World Insight CGTN into your search engine or check out our YouTube channel. Follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Sina Weibo. From me, Tian Wei, and everyone on the World Insight team, thanks for watching. Tune in again next time for insights across China and around the world. Good night.